Okay, so good afternoon and you're very welcome to the online launch of the National Farm Survey preliminary results for 2019. Uh, my name is Mark Gibson and I'll be moderating today's session. Today I'm joined by the Director of Chagas, Professor Jerry Boyle, uh, Mr. Brian Morn, Head of National Farm Survey Department and Trevor Donlan, Head of Economics and Surveys uh, with Chagas. Uh, we'll also be joined later on by Dr. Kevin Hanrahan, who's head of the Chagas Rural Economy and Development Programme. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today on today's webinar. So, um, thank you. Thank Mark. you. So to the format of today's uh, session is going to be, we're going to have a, a short introduction by our uh, director uh, and then followed by a presentation from Trevor Donlan and then also by Brian Morn. So uh, we want to try and make today's session as interactive as possible. So we do encourage you to send us your questions by clicking on the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Today's session is being recorded as well and will be available to view afterwards along with a copy of the presentation on the Chagas website and also the Chagas YouTube channel. So uh, Professor Boyle, I ask you to uh, introduce today's session and uh, we will then hand over to Trevor for his presentation. Thanks, Mark. Can you hear me all right there? Yes, you sound good there. Okay. Um, every, you're, you're all very welcome to this year's uh, National Farm Survey um, report. And uh, we apologize, we're a little bit later this year, but I think everyone will appreciate that COVID uh, adversely affected our ability to get the survey results out. Um, expeditiously. Um, in fact, this we're, we're running this survey now well over 40 years as part of what's called the Farm Accounting, uh, Farm Accounts Data Network of the, Europe, of the EU. And um, you'll probably be aware that uh, one of the initiatives in the recently published Farm to Fork strategy was that um, this survey would now become known in the future as the Farm Sustainability Data Network. And only last week, many of you may already, may have also attended our uh, webinar on the Farm Sustainability Report, which is based on the, on the National Farm Survey. So um, today we're focusing on farm incomes across the different enterprises and systems in Irish agriculture. And it is a, what we, what we label as the preliminary report for 2019, uh, and we will publish the final report toward the end of the year. But notwithstanding that, we don't expect to see any major changes between now and the final version later in the year. I want um, to, to thank all of the farmers, your 900 farmers who um, have enabled us to undertake this survey without their cooperation, we simply, simply wouldn't be able to assemble this hugely important information. And of course, I would also like to thank my own colleagues, um, Trevor Donnell and Brian Morden, and of course, especially our team of recorders uh, who gather all the information. And I would like to make a special shout out to one of them, uh, who's retiring in October. In fact, he joined on Fora Saluntas more around more or less the same time that I did, that's Eamon McGrath. I want to wish Eamon the very best. And he's an exemplar of the professionalism of our farm recorder. So it's, it's back to you, Mark. You're on mute, Mark. Sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you, Trevor. Um, thank you for that, uh, Professor Boyle. We're going to go straight to Trevor uh, now for your presentation. So Trevor, I ask you to share your screen. And uh, so what we'll do is we'll, we will take questions at, at the very end. We'll allow for the two presentations to go through. And uh, please do uh, send through your questions at any stage during procedures and proceedings. We will we'll endeavor to try and get us through as many questions uh, at the end of today's session. So uh, do bear with us. Thank you. Okay, Mark, can you hear me okay? Yes, you sound good. Yeah. You can see that cover slide. Yes, yes. Okay, we'll, we'll, we'll fire on. Um, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody, and uh, thanks for tuning in to this um, National Farm Survey results webinar. We don't 
ordinarily do a presentation of these results to the public. Normally we confine uh, the presentation uh, to the media, but we thought that given the, uh, the circumstances we currently find ourselves under, it might be a good opportunity to launch a webinar to present that results to, because we, we do know there are a lot of people interested out there uh, in the detail of the results. And while we will bring you some of the detail here today, um, there's, there's a huge amount more that you can actually get uh, from, from digging into the actual uh, publication that we produce and even this presentation here. So I'd just like to acknowledge uh, my co-authors here, Brian Moore and John Lennon, Emma Dillon, uh, the team of recorders, and again, the farmers, uh, the recording team and farmers went to all manner of lengths this year within the limitations of social distancing to make sure that we got the uh, data we required to be able to get to the point where we are today. So the structure of the presentation is as follows. I'm going to talk to you for about um, 15 or 20 minutes and Brian will then take out the rest of the presentation. So I'm going to talk firstly about the definition of family farm income because I know there will be some people on the call who might be familiar with that. And we're going to look at the summary situation on average in Ireland in 2019. After that, then we're going to move in and look at uh, what we call the farm systems analysis, where we look at the income levels in the different types of farms that we find in Ireland. We're covering five main systems of farming uh, in Ireland, as you'll see in a moment. We also then look at income distribution, income distribution from the perspective of the entire farm population we're looking at, and also in respect of the individual systems as well. So how, you know, into what ranges do the income levels that are achieved actually fall for the populations of the farms across the various systems. We also will look at some regional analysis for dairy and for the cattle systems. Um, and then we'll switch through to some detailed uh, analysis on the direct payments, uh, have a brief look at investment and borrowing and round the, out the presentation with a review of some farm demographic, to, excuse me, farm demographics and farm viability. And uh, at that point, I think we'll open it up for, for uh, some Q&A and discussion. So um, most important point, I think for people to understand, or one of the most important points to understand is what our definition of family farm income is. And it's a definition um, a standard definition, um, which we follow uh, in terms of our reporting under the Farm Accountancy Data Network. So it's an EU standard that we're reporting to here. And our definition of family farm income, um, the particular thing to note about it is that it, it doesn't place a cost on the farmer's own labour or the farm family's own labour contribution to the farm. So the bottom line family farm income uh, figure is basically the return to family labour, um, any management activities associated with the farm and the capital that's tied up uh, in the farm. We talk a lot about averages in this presentation. You shouldn't go away thinking that the averages give you the, the entirety of the story. We'll also look at these things here, these complicated looking things called box plots, which show you um, the distribution um, around any particular within any particular population of farms that we're looking at in this particular example we're looking at three regions in ireland over the space of 2017 to 2019 and we're looking at the level of concentrate feed usage per dairy cow um, and we're looking at the distribution of that so you can see um for example here that generally speaking in the southern region the median level which is the the bar that's in the middle of the green box, tends to be lower than in the other regions. Um, what you also see is the box itself, and the box basically is an indicator of where 50% of the farms lie. So between the 25th and the 75th percentile of farms in a distribution lie within the boundaries of that box. And the, uh, the whiskers, as we call them, and the tails, they take you out and, and give you an indication of the full extent of the distribution uh, with respect to a particular variable. So you can see that 
Um, for all of these variables here in this example, there's actually a very wide distribution, but you can see that um, there are the clustering around the, that middle 50% tends to be tighter uh, in some cases than in others. And it's just an important way, reminder, I guess, as we go through the presentation, that the average is not the entirety of the story. Um, over on the right here, we see some information on grass growth. So what we're looking at here is the grass growth figure for 2019, a five-year average and a comparison of those with 2018. And if you remember back to 2018, 2018 was a very challenging year for grassland systems and for tillage for that matter uh, in Ireland. And we saw um, the drought conditions in the summertime. We also saw um, heavy snow conditions uh, around the end of February and uh, into the beginning of March. I was very lucky not to be trapped in Brussels when that happened. I'm very happy to get home. Um, but as you can see, 2019 here was a very normal year, really, in terms of grass growth. And that's telling a big part of the story as we go through this presentation on the grassland systems. It's a story of costs of production coming down because of reduced input usage requirement. We had high levels of feed and fertilizer use in 2018. Uh, which were not repeated to the same extent in 2019 because of the fact that weather conditions were more normal. So we'll be coming back to that cost story as we go through the presentation. So onto the next slide. Um, and we're looking here at the distribution of that farm population. So we're representing 92,500 farms or thereabouts in the National Farm Survey this year. Now that's not the totality of the number of farms in Ireland. There are probably 40,000 plus other very, very small farms uh, in Ireland, which fall outside of the threshold that we use for inclusion in the National Farm Survey, the annual survey. We do survey those very small farms on uh, at about a five year interval, just to make sure that we can capture what's going on in those farms also. But for the purposes of this presentation, these 92,500 farms represent in excess of 90% of the agricultural output um, produced in Ireland and, and not about 90% of the land base as well in terms of uh, what's available for agriculture. Um, in excess Sorry, of farmers, what do you classify as a small farm, just to clarify that? Uh, it's, a, it's a farm with a standard output of less than 8,000 8, 8, euro. Um, so that's, that's quite small, basically, Mark. So even, even some of the farms we have included here uh, by comparison, say, with the activity on a dairy farm or a tillage farm would be considered small. But it's, it's, it's really very small farms that we're talking about that don't fall inside um, the threshold for inclusion here. So we have about a little over half the farms are, are cattle farms. Uh, and the next most prominent after that would be dairy and sheep and uh, tillage then making up um, a smaller portion. And then we have this tiny category here called mixed livestock, um, which are basically uh, livestock farms that don't fit within the other uh, livestock farm uh, definitions. But they're very small in number in Ireland, and we, we, we're not really going to report very much on, in, in respect of them in, in this presentation. Um, middle box here, you'll see, I should be using this arrow, I guess, to help you see where I'm talking. Um, Average income in 2019 was just a little under 24,000 euro, and that represented about a 2% increase in, uh, um, in uh, income relative to um, the income level in 2018. Big story uh, here was the recovery in dairy income. It was quite a good recovery in dairy income, although not to the level we would have expected when we were looking at forecasting this about six months ago. So um, that while there was a reduction in milk price and a reduction in production costs that more than offset that, um, the, the cost of production didn't decrease quite to the extent that we expected them to. Um, obviously seeing the big disparities between dairy and the other systems, um, particularly the dry, the two dry, the three dry stock systems here, cattle rearing, cattle other, and uh, sheep. And uh, somewhere in between then, of, obviously, then is the tillage sector um, where the farms are 
comparable in size to dairy farms, but um, not, not achieving the same level of profitability per hectare. If you take the entirety of the income that's uh, available to these 92,000 farms and split it across the various systems, we see that even though dairy farms um, represent only 16,000 of those 92,000 farms, almost half of the income uh, in the sector is accruing to those farms. So the, the, the fact that dairy farms have this very high level of income both per hectare and in absolute terms uh, is, is the reason behind that. Um, so yeah, that's the, the broad outline of the story in uh, 2019. Um, we can also, as I said, use these box plots to look at the distribution of income. So while I'm talking about average income at times, I'm talking about the medium in, median income here in respect of these box plots. Um, you know, the, the median and the average would be the same if you had a perfect normal distribution for the people who are statistically minded out there. Um, but the median in most cases here won't be too far off the, the, the average figure. Uh, you see some exceptions here like on the tillage system. Um, big, big variations, I guess that's the important thing to take of note in some sectors, big variations uh, in the distribution of incomes on dairy farms, uh, similar situation in respect of tillage farms, less so in respect of the cattle and sheep systems. These are income levels uh, per farm, so they reflect both the profitability of per hectare and the size of the farm. So we should expect uh, you know, all things being equal, we would expect the dairy farms and tillage farms to have higher incomes anyway, because they are typically, um, you know, 60, 80% larger than on average than the, the other farm categories. Um, one of the, the aspects of agriculture as well in Ireland is that the labour contribution on our labour requirement, I should say, on these farms varies as well. So dairy farms are the most labour intensive farms uh, in Ireland. Um, factors such as uh, the need to milk dairy cows uh, on a daily basis contributing to that, of course. So about one, it requires about 1.38 uh, family labour units or unpaid labour units uh, on a dairy farm in Ireland. And for the other systems, you can see that they're generally speaking much closer to one labour unit and even less than one labour unit in respect of the two cattle systems here. So what you can do is you can take these numbers here and divide them through by these numbers here and come up with this graph over here, which is showing you basically the uh, family farm income for an annual work unit. And the most uh, striking thing to note within that chart, I guess, is that it reduces the disparity that you see here between dairy and tillage. You see these, these guys here are getting the tillage guys are getting much closer to the dairy guys in terms of the distribution of the income levels and that's because of the fact that the labor input on tillage farms is a good bit less than what is required on a dairy farm um, and this chart here is just uh, showing the averages based off the numbers that we we see up here and you can see as i said that uh, when you adjust for the labor contribution and express it in a a labour unit basis, the income level, or average income level on dairy farms falls to about 50,000 and the average uh, on tillage increases to nearly 40,000. So that disparity that you see there between the 66 and the 34 uh, is reduced somewhat. Less interesting um, changes in respect of the other systems because of the fact that you're dividing through by, by, by unity basically, uh, or almost that. So we move to the uh, next slide, which is talking about the distribution uh, of income. Um, this chart here on the top right is showing you the distribution overall. So we see that 44% of the farms that are represented in the survey have income levels of 10,000 euro or less. And up at the other extreme, we see that 4% of farms in 2019 had income levels in excess of 100,000. And uh, the bulk of the rest of the farms uh, fall into relatively low income categories, still 10 to 20 and 20 to 30. Uh, but we do have some farms in the over 30,000 uh, category, uh, or these categories here between 30,000 and 100,000. 
Those farms at this end of the distribution are predominantly found as dairy farms over here. And you can see that in the, the, the relative uniformity, I guess, of the distribution of incomes on, on dairy farms. So you see, for example, in excess of 20% or close to 20% of dairy farms have income levels in excess of 100,000 in 2019. And in the 70 to 100,000 category, and 50 to 70,000 category, those numbers are quite healthy also. Uh, contrast that with the situation in, say, the cattle rearing system, and we could be easily looking at any of the other dry stock systems in terms of this pie chart, where we see uh, close to two thirds of the farms have income levels uh, no greater than 10,000 euro. Family farm income levels, this is, of course, these uh, data here exclude any other income sources from, say, an off farm job. So it's one of contrasts, I guess. We, if we had a pie chart here for the tillage sector, it would look a little bit more like what we see here for dairy than it does, say, for cattle. But for cattle, for rearing, for uh, which is suckler production, basically, or for uh, the, what we call the cattle other system, which is mainly uh, farms that are operating finishing type systems for cattle or if you were looking at sheep farms, the distribution of incomes would be somewhat similar to what we're looking at here for the cattle uh, rearing system. Trevor, could I just ask you before you move on to the next slide, just how yep. those figures trending that distribution within the enterprises? Uh, we don't see a mark huge movement uh, from year to year. Uh, you know, they, we don't see seismic shifts in, in that distribution through time. Usually what you see is, slight movements upwards and downwards uh, within, you know, maybe jumping into the neighbouring uh, income category or falling back into the neighbouring income category, depending on the year concerned. But, um, you know, if you were to look at any data um, going back um, even over decades, I think we would see that the, the story generally is one of dairy and tillage farms having a healthier um, distribution of income than we would see in the in the dry stock systems. Thank you. Um, okay, so what we also do in this analysis uh, for both dairy and for um, the cattle systems, we look at this from a regional perspective. So we have three regions that we look at where our survey is not big enough to allow us to go right down, say, to county levels of detail. We would have enough farms to have a statistically valid sample for some counties, but not for some smaller counties, for example. So the most reliable way to look at this from a statistical point of view in terms of representativity of the national population is to look at it at, at the region level that we have here. So we have a southern region, which is effectively Munster plus Kilkenny, Carlow and Wexford. We have an eastern region, which I think largely corresponds to the rest of Leinster. And then we have a kind of a Connacht Ulster bordery kind of region as well, which we call, which we call the Northern and Western um, region. And, you know, there are clear differences across these regions. And um, the first one, I guess, to look at is the fact that this Eastern region here has the fewest farms. We've got about um, 40,000 farms in the Southern region, 34,000 in the Northwest, but only about 18,000 in um, this eastern region here, which is obviously the smallest geographically um, as well. Other, other things to note, uh, the average farm size, the utilizable, the agricultural area, as it's called, tends to be on average much larger in the southern and eastern and midland region than it would be in this um, uh, northern and western region up here. So the, the smaller farms in Ireland are more concentrated in this part of the country and that is also reflected in the income stories that we will see later on as well. Also of note, the cattle farms tend to be more clustered in this region. So you've got in excess of 23,000 cattle farms in this region here, um, something more like 20,000 in the southern region and only about 9,000 in the eastern region here. And sheep farms again, more concentrated in this region here. So about 8,000 8, of our sheep farms, out of the, I think it was about 14,000 sheep farms are located in this region here. So generally a story of 
um, bigger farms in this part of the country, smaller farms in this part of the country. Uh, huge generalization, but it, it, it is helpful in understanding um, the story of Irish agriculture if, you're, if you happen to be new to it. Um, so we're going to talk now a little about the dairy sector. So what I have here are some um, summary statistics on what's been happening on average on dairy farms in Ireland pretty much since we've known that the quota was going to be eliminated. You know, so we had a period before the quota was removed of gradual quota expansion. And then obviously in 2015, we had the complete removal of the milk quota system. This chart here is just looking at the average cow numbers uh, on dairy farms in Ireland over time. And you've seen that increase quite strongly over time. If you just look at the, the figure here for 2013, for example, uh, we go from 66 cows right up to almost 80 cows now in um, 2019. Um, these are, the gap between cow numbers and the total livestock units on these farms is mainly composed of uh, the replacement animals uh, on these farms and to some extent as well younger animals that might be retained uh, on this farm for a period of time who, that might later be sold. Um, into the beef system. So impressive increase. I mean, you, sh you know, you need to probably look at these charts afterwards yourself or the numbers in them and calculate the percentages because we're using different scales here on the different axes so it can hide uh, the, the trends. I don't rely on exclusively on the, on the, um, the angle of the, the curves we're looking at. So we'll go down here in terms of milk yield, you can see a story as well of, in, of, an, of an increase, but it's not a dramatic increase. We have a very tight axis here, in, in fact, just to help you see it. Um, so while there has been an increase in milk yield um, uh, over time, uh, reaching about 5,600 litres on average at this point, it's the lesser part of the story behind this increase we've seen, we're seeing over here. I'll blow this one out for a second. Uh, if I can, yeah. Um, so what we're looking at here is the increase in the um, milk production and milk sales uh, on average in Ireland um, over the period since 2010. The gap between the two, and for those that are wondering what the gap is, the gap is the milk that's retained on a farm to be fed to calves, essentially. But we've reached a point now where we're up around 11,800 litres uh, in terms of milk production and about 11,400 litres on average in terms of milk that's actually sold off the farm delivered for, for, for processing. So that's been an impressive trend, upward trend, I think, uh, over time uh, that we've actually seen the bit of a dip down here back in 2012. That was that fodder crisis from back at that period in case you're wondering what happened back then. Um, so what else we want to talk about here? The, the area has been increasing on these farms as well, not dramatically so, and in fact it's kind of stabilised in the last few years. Um, so there's we're kind of seeing stabilisation in the average size of these farms in the last few years. Um, but obviously because of this increase in cow numbers, um, we've seen an increase in stocking rate as well over time. So the stocking rate now on the average dairy farm of about 2.1. Um, livestock units. A livestock unit is basically um, a da one dairy cow, if you're not familiar with that terminology. Um, okay, looking at the specifics for uh, the dairy results. So the average income on dairy farms in Ireland in 2019, according to our preliminary estimate, is a little under €67,000, which is a little bit less, uh, to be frank, than what we were we had anticipated when we were making forecasts of this about six months back. And the reason for why it's not, as, not a little bit higher than this is because the cost story has actually turned out to be not as benign as we had expected. So while there has been a reduction in fertilizer use and there has been a reduction in feed use per head in uh, 2019 uh, on the back of the reversion to normal weather conditions, the reduction hasn't been as large, the cost reduction hasn't been as large as we uh, had anticipated. And you can see that over here, if we look at um, production cost per litre of milk. So we had this big jump in 2018, where we went from about 23 and a half cent on average, up to a little over 27 cent per litre. 
And a, a lot of that, what happened there was increased feed use, basically. Um, we've seen a reduction in costs in 2019, but not back to the level we were in 2017. You know, some of the inputs were a bit more expensive in 2019, but we still had anticipated maybe a bigger reduction in production costs in 19 than we've, what we were actually reporting at uh, this point in time. Okay, down the bottom left here as well, you can see some summary statistics just in terms of family farm income per hectare, family farm income per cow, just words of caution about all of these variables, you know, their averages and, you know, applying those average figures to a farm that you don't know much about could be, could be an error because you don't really know where that farm is going to lie in the, the distribution in these box plots that I've been talking about already in the presentation. So um, an increase in income on, da on dairy farms, about uh, I think 10% or so um, in um, 2019. Okay, um, we can also look at the, that in a bit more detail at that uh, input cost storyline. Um, in particular, uh, the change we've seen in 19 versus 18. So what we got on this chart here is um, the distribution of feed use, so how much feed use was used on these various farms in, in the population of uh, dairy farms that we have in 18 and 19. Uh, and we, what we've done is we've decomposed that population by stocking rate. So you've got here farms that are 1.5 livestock units or lower per hectare, 1.5 to 2 and in excess of 2. And I guess what you, you know, you see some things that are, you would expect are obvious, like, uh, for example, the fact that as stocking rate increases, the level of feed use will tend to increase. You see that the distribution here, obviously, is, and here, is higher than the one here. Uh, what else do you see in 2019? Um, there was a reduction in feed use, but it was only marginal in the case of the, those farms with low stocking rate, and that should be no surprise given that these farms were not under anything like the same pressure for grass availability as were the farms at higher stocking rates back in, back in 2018 in the difficult weather conditions. So we're seeing big reductions in feed use at higher stocking rates, very sizable reductions in feed use volumes at higher stocking rates, um, which is contributing to cost reductions on farms with higher stocking rates in 2019. Um, looking at the performance per hectare on a, at a national level, we don't see mo very much happening in terms of gross output. The gross output is basically the value of milk sales uh, of these farms. And that hasn't changed very much over the three years we're looking at here. And, the re and we have seen reductions in milk price over these three years, but what we have seen is that the increase in milk volume is tending to offset those reductions. So more milk per hectare here, and here, ultimately, offsetting reductions that occurred in the milk price relative to, say, 2017. So not, not much happening in terms of what's coming in the door in terms of the size of the milk check. Uh, where the action is more particularly is in respect to the direct costs of production. So that's costs like fertilizer, costs like feed, costs like um, contracting charges to produce silage. So what we've seen, uh, bulky feeds as well. So what we've seen is that those direct costs went up dramatically in 2018 due to the adverse weather conditions. We've come back a bit in 2019, but not as much as we might have thought they would have done, ultimately. Um, so we, we have seen an improvement in family farm income in 2019. So we're up to 1,132. Um, euro per hectare in income, and that's inclusive of um, support payments, and versus 1,046 in uh, 2018. And most of the story behind that, as I say, is um, lower production costs. The vo feed volume story on a national basis, you can see quite here, you can see that we had a huge increase here of in excess of 300 kgs in the average level of feed use per cow due to the adverse weather conditions in 18. Uh, big reduction in 2019, uh, but not back quite to the level of 2017. So it's about 100 uh, kgs, or the best part of 100 
extra kgs of feed going into the average dairy cow in 2019 compared to what there was in 17. Having said that, we're getting more milk out of that cow as well. So 11.8 versus 11.4 back in um, 2017. Um, moving to the next slide, we're again, we're just looking at these, that cost story. Um, the direct costs and the, and the overhead costs, the direct costs have come down in uh, 2019 due to lower levels of feed use and lower levels of fertilizer use. Um, so, but not, not, not down to the level where we were at in 2017. So, you know, um, that, that aspect, I suppose, is one of the reasons why we're not seeing quite a high, as high a level of average farm income in 2019 as we might have expected uh, to be the case uh, a number of months ago. Um, and we can uh, aggregate these up to national or to uh, average farm level totals as well in terms of total cost of production. So as you can see here, um, close to 90,000 in, in terms of direct costs and about 60,000 in terms of um, overhead costs on uh, your average dairy farm. Um, so just another way of looking at that, just in terms of the decomposition of those direct costs and those overhead costs into the various different cost items. Um, in this, uh, you know, that's something that really you can look at, uh, I would say, at your leisure. I'll just point to a few things. See the reduction here in uh, concentrates, for example, reduction in 2019 reductions as well, in that bulky feed item in uh, 2019. And on the, moving in the opposite direction, we see a little bit more spelt on fertilizer with um, lower levels of usage being more than offset by higher prices for um, fertilizer in 2019. So we can look at some regional analysis for dairy as well. And remember the three regions are this Munster or South Leinster region, the rest of Leinster region effectively, and um, the, this kind of Connacht Ulster border type region. Um, what do we see there? Well, we see um, well-established, I guess, differences in production costs, uh, a lot of which are to do with uh, differentials in the level of feed usage. Uh, you can see here that in 2019, the average farm in the northern and western region was feeding nearly half a ton more feed than the comparable farm in the Pacau and the comparable farm in the southern region. And that farm in the northern and western region was a good way off as well. What was happening in the eastern and midlands region? We're not suggesting for a moment that this is down to um, the lack of human capital on the part of farmers. It, you know, I mean, it, it reflects probably it reflects inferior land conditions, inferior climatic conditions, uh, longer winter, shorter growing season, all this well-established stuff. But it, it it is significant because it produces. Um, a, alone a two percent a two cent differential in terms of um production costs between these farms and the farms in the, in the rest of the country just looking at um the performance in terms of um family farm income per cow we see that the best performing farms on average are in the southern region and the weakest are in the northern and uh, western region so there's quite a big disparity uh, even within the dairy farm category in terms of the, uh, the level of profitability that's achieved. Also of interest, I guess, in this chart is the evolution of farm size as measured by the number of cows or the average number of cows over time. And what we see, I think that's interesting here, is the fact that in the eastern and midland region, the average herd size it continues to grow more rapidly than is the case in the other two regions in our analysis. So you can see here, just even from 2016 through to 2019, that there has been an addition of about 10 additional cows to the average uh, farm in the Eastern and Midlands region. Whereas in the other two regions, you, you know, that there has been relatively modest growth in the average herd size. So this is suggestive, I guess, that it, it, it may be easier to, to expand farm size in this Eastern and Midland region, I guess in part, uh, compared to the southern region, that it's uh, a region where you're less likely to find um, dairy farms butting up against each other. Say, you know, if you compare that situation with, with 
say parts of Cork where you where everybody might be a dairy farmer and, and opportunities to increase land size and uh, add to the herd are, are more limited. Um, so yeah, the other I guess the other take home from the slide just to remind you that the, you know the average farm size as measured by cows um, is that bit bigger on, on, on in the eastern and midlands region compared to the other two categories. Not just so much that it's been growing faster, but there is that big differential, you know, to, um, be, between um, farms in that region and um, in the southern region. And um, I guess what's important to note as well that you might have, you know, you have typically quite large average herd sizes in Waterford and Kilkenny, but those are actually both in the southern region that we're looking at. So up in this region here, which I don't think we would normally think as a strong region for dairy production, you do have some uh, quite large dairy farms at this stage. Moving on to cattle, um, you know, so we're moving into different territory now in terms of uh, income numbers here compared to where we were with dairy. So we're down at around 9,000 euro um, or a little over 9,000 euro for the average cattle rearing farm. So this is a suckler farm essentially we're talking about uh, in um, 2019. And, you know, the story of this sector and other dry stock sectors continues to be one where the support payments, which are shown here in the darker colour, continue to exceed the family farm income that's achieved on these farms. So these farms are making an operating loss. And, you know, in 2019, we're talking about the guts of 5,000 euro, excuse me, coming from the single farm payment uh, to cover losses being made. Uh, on the operating of, of that farm. So that, those are quite stark figures, I think. Um, now, there was a lot happening in the cattle sector, as you know, in uh, 2019. And we saw the provision of additional support, such as the difficulties in the sector through the, uh, um, the BEAM measure. So that um, made for a significant increase in the support payments for that sector. You know, don't get too excited by these big percentages because they're big percentages on fairly small numbers. Um, but we did see a big, a uh, biggish increase in direct payments uh, for this farm category. We saw savings on the cost side, predominantly because of the better weather conditions. So we had reduced feed usage and reduced fertilizer usage as well, contributing to an 8% reduction in uh, direct costs. So taking all these factors together, we saw an 11% increase in family farm income. Uh, on average in this production system, which uh, meant that um, we were uh, going from 8,200 to 9,200 euro uh, in terms of average income. So it's less exciting when expressed in, 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 the, in the ball numbers of, of the absolute income level. So um, yeah, uh, you know, challenging times, I guess, in, in the cattle rearing system. Looking at the story at a regional level, uh, again, for the three regions for the cattle rearing system, doesn't tell us um, uh, anything particularly different. Across all three regions, the story is somewhat similar. Okay, the income levels on average are that bit higher in the eastern and midland region. Uh, farm size is also a little bit higher in that region, which is contributing uh, at least in part to that story. But what we see across all three regions is the story of the support payments exceeding the family farm income, and, and, and quite considerably so, really, in res particularly in respect of the northern and western region, and even more so in this uh, in the southern region. About half of these cattle rearing farms are in the northwest here, so we see about half of them, all, thirteen thousand of those farms are located in that part of the country. So, um, you know, even at a regional level, there isn't, uh, there isn't particularly any, any more positive of a story to take in respect of what's uh, happening on these farms from, a, from the perspective, at least of uh, their economic performance. Uh, we'll talk about what they might be doing for the environment a different time, I guess. Uh, moving to the cattle other system, uh, income level average in 2019 was a little under 14,000 euro. Again, these farms were recipients uh, in, of beam support. So the um, direct payments average for this farm category increased by about 10% in 2019 compared to the 2018 level. 
These farms struggled a bit more on the output side because of the fall off in cattle prices, but they did benefit from a reduction in both uh, feed and fertilizer expenditure. Again, largely a story of lower volumes of usage in um, 2019 compared to 2018. So direct costs down about 6%. And taken uh, collectively, we, we end up in a situation where family farm income for this category is actually down 5% based on our preliminary estimate compared to the 2018 level. So, um, yeah, the story again, maybe not as, uh, as pronounced as in the cattle rearing system of support payments exceeding agricultural income by, again, the tune of about uh, 4,000 euro um, in the average in 2019. Okay, uh, if, we, if we take that, uh, cattle other system and, and look at the regional results again uh, you know there isn't huge differentials across the regions here and um, the you know it, it is the case across all these systems that support payments exceed uh, income they're much more uniformly distributed across the three regions you know there isn't uh, any particular concentration maybe a little a little bit fewer in the eastern and midlands region but that is the smallest of the three regions geographically um, other takeaway to take, I guess, from this chart is the fact that we do see quite a differential in terms of the off-farm employment of the farm operator, the farm holder. So we do see that in the northern and western region, in excess of half of the farm holders are working also off-farm. That compares with only about one third in the eastern and midlands and southern regions. So off-farm uh, job holding uh, is much more prominent or prevalent, I should say, in this northern and western region than would be the case in the other two regions. Now, that doesn't tell us anything in terms of how much money they're actually pulling in from that off-farm employment. That's a, a, a separate issue, but it is the case that a higher percentage of farm holders in that northern and western region have uh, an off-farm income. Moving on to sheep, uh, the story on sheep is probably in some respects a bit more positive in the sense that we have, uh, we're reporting an increase in family farm income of about 9% in uh, 2019. Um, while lamb prices were down a bit, it wasn't as quite a severe situation as was experienced in the cattle sector. What we did see was a very big reduction in feed bills on sheep farms. And if you can remember back to the early parts of 2018, you remember those that, that, that cold snap and snowy conditions and what have you. So there was very high levels of feed use on sheep farms in the first quarter of um, uh, 2018. And, and it is that quarter of the year that is the highest level of, of feed usage on, uh, on, on sheep farms. So that didn't, didn't obviously arise in 2019. So you saw a big saving on feed. Um, and an overall reduction in costs of about 6% on um, sheep farms in 2019. Lower spending on feed as well, or sorry, fertilizer as well, contributing to that cost reduction. Um, these farms also benefited to some extent from the beam money because sheep farms, some sheep farms will have a cattle enterprise and that could be eligible for beam support. Um, but again, with, these system, with this system, you see the story that the support payments do exceed the income that's achieved on these farms by, by quite an amount. Uh, again, four or five thousand euro of a loss being reported on these farms before the uh, single farm or before the direct payments are taken into consideration. Um, on to tillage, finally, and I'll pass over to uh, Brian. Um, are on a reminder for people that tillage farms in Ireland very often will also have another enterprise on that farm and it's typically some form of a cattle enterprise. So when we're talking about tillage farm incomes here we're reporting on both the performance of the farm as a cereal farm and the performance of the farm in the context of whatever other enterprise it has and, and as I say most often that is a cattle type system. Um, you know, it was a very, 2019 was a very different year from uh, the perspective of production conditions compared to 2018. So you had some big boost in yield, in cereal yield, on these farms in 2019. 
But um, what we saw due to also due to international supply and demand conditions in, in cereals and oilseed markets was a big reduction in the Irish cereals price. So prices were down of the order of 20 to 30 percent, depending on um, the type of um, the type of grain you were selling and whether it was a winter or spring crop. Um, Having said all that, uh, again, these farms were, you know, where they had a cattle, cattle enterprise could have been eligible for some support and, and, and many of them did deliver or did it, um, were in receipt of support under the BEAM measure. Um, so the end outcome uh, for tillage farms in 2019, while it's not great, it, it could have been worse, I, was, well, I think was what we would say. So incomes went from about 40,000 down to 34,000. Um, you know, I think at one stage we thought those income levels could be as low as 30,000. Um, but, uh, you know, in part, I guess, the support coming from the uh, beam measure and in part the fact that yields were actually that good uh, mitigated the reductions that would have otherwise happened due to the, the big uh, drop off in prices. So if you went back through time here over kind of a two or three or four year period, you, you would have seen a gradual recovery in uh, tillage farm incomes out to this 40,000 euro mark in 2018. And I guess the disappointing aspect from the perspective of tillage farmers is that, you know, they've seen, a, you know, a lot of that, a lot of those gains eroded in 2019 in terms of the fall off in, in the average income level in, uh, in that system. So at that point, I think I'm done and I'm gonna pass you over to Brian and Brian's gonna take you through the rest of the presentation. So over to you, Brian. Thanks for that, uh, Trevor. And uh, just while Brian is getting set up there to remind you to, you can submit your questions to us through the Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. Um, we are running a little bit over time, so I hope you can uh, stay with us after the hour uh, where we'll have the opportunity to you have the opportunity to have your questions answered. Brian, are you able to join us? It's not looking good, is it? No, no, he just needs to. So sorry, Mark, no. Welcome back, Brian. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to get my, uh, I'm trying to uh, get my, get my screen, get my screen up if I, if, if I can. Uh, see, see, can we uh, share it there? Hopefully it's coming up now. Yeah, that's, that's no, okay. Sorry about the gremlins. Huh? Yeah, no problem. Okay, so, listen, I'm going to take you through the, 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 the final part of the presentation. Basically what we'll do here is we'll focus on uh, a couple of things like direct payments, investment, uh, and uh, debt levels um, and finish with something about maybe demographics and, and viability. So if we start with direct payments, obviously you'd have seen there from um, Trevor's uh, presentation how important uh, the level of direct payments are on, on Irish farms. So if we were to look at, uh, let's say, across all systems and the average across all systems, which is this orange hatch line, uh, both these graphs are actually related. So what you'll see on the top line, at the top graph is the, the payment per farm uh, and the bottom is, is the payment per hectare. So um, basically last year, the average payment per farm was 18,400 euros. Okay, so the average farm then is about 43 hectares. That means we have an average payment per farm of about 427 euros per hectare last year. Okay, and what you'll note from the, from the graph is that we continue to see a, a kind of a, an increase in the modest, maybe, but an increase since 2015 in the level of direct payment per farm. Okay, so we had a, a gradual decline uh, since 2010. And in 2015, we saw the introduction of schemes like GLOSS, uh, the BGP scheme, um, the sheep welfare scheme. And this year we have the, the new uh, BEEP scheme for circular farmers. And we've also had this uh, BEAM money that, ha that has been paid in 2019. So that has, has led to an increase in direct payments. Uh, on a, on a, a farm type basis, what you generally see is the tillage farmers have, have the highest payments. Okay, so the average payment on, 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 a tillage, on a tillage farm is in the region of 25,000 euros, but you'll see on the bottom graph, it's below, below the actual average per hectare. 
nationally. And that's because tillage farms tend to be a lot bigger. So the average tillage farm in Ireland is about 60 hectares in size, whereas a, a cattle rearing uh, sector farmer tends to be around 32 hectares. So if you were to look at the cattle rearing, the cattle rearing systems, you see the average payment per hectare is around 460 euros. Okay, and that has really tracked up since 2015. So they've, they've benefited from firstly the BGDP gloss uh, and this year from BEEP and, uh, and, and the genomics scheme. And that's very similar if you look at the cattle other system, system which is primarily finishers and the sheep, the, the sheep system. So you see basically all farms in these systems have generally trended upwards. Uh, on their payments per hectare si since 2015. The one system where the, things, where the trajectory will be a bit different is if we were to look at, at dairy farmers and the, the payment per hectare has actually been de decreasing uh, since 2015. And I suppose that's the nature of the way that the new schemes have been targeted at the, at the lower income, uh, the lower income systems. Uh, on these dairy farms, uh, they still have a quite substantial uh, farm payments uh, like they're still getting 20,000 euros per, per farm, but most of their payment is composed of pillar one type payment, uh, the, ba the basic payment scheme. So if we, if, if we look at these pillar one and, and pillar two payments, so pillar one is the single farm payment, it will also include protein payments. Uh, this year it includes the beam money, that beam money is paid under a, a regulation uh, from the commission that deems it to be a pillar one payment. And then we have all the, the schemes, I suppose, we would, be, we would normally associate uh, that we would be all familiar with, the ANC scheme, the GLOSS scheme, BGP. These are all pillar two type payments. So on average, across the country, 70% of payments come in the, in the form of a pillar, a pillar one type payment. Okay, so basically uh, the, the, single, the single farm payment uh, uh, as, we, as, we, as we would know it. Um, on average last year, the average single farm payment was just under 12,000 euros, 11,900 euros, um, down marginally from, from the, previous, the previous two years, down about 100 euros per, 100 euros per farm. Um, if we look at this regionally, you begin to see a difference. So nationally, we have a 70-30 split. We, we see differences across systems. So obviously, the pillar two payments are more important than the cattle rearing farms than they are on, on, on dairy farms. And that comes through if you look at it on, on a regional basis. In the eastern midland region, quarter of the payments are, are pillar, pillar two type payments. But in the north and west, uh, see over 40% of the payments are what we would call pillar two payments. So if we, if we, if we look at those in, in, in a bit more detail, uh, what, what we see over here is we see um, that across all systems, we have farmers getting gloss payments. So um, they're, they're important across, across all farming systems, but the environmental schemes, the gloss scheme are much more important on the dry sock systems. So on average, gloss average adds 1900 euros per farm. But it adds more to the, the average sheep farmer than it would say to, a, to a, the average dairy farm. So obviously the glass scheme is much more important there. And I suppose as we as we move now to a stage where glass is about to be to finish up and this talk of a of a of a new environmental scheme, it'd be particularly interesting interesting to see how, how that how that is focused. Um, we should take back here to the national picture. So if we look at the, the national results here for for um, the, the, the red bar, so the red bar is the beef payments. So what we have is BGGP and beef uh, are coming in here. So obviously they'll be much more important on the cattle rearing system. And on average, they add 1600 euros in 2019 to farm income. And that's on average. And we would know that not, not every farm participates in, in all those schemes. So if we, if we look at that in a bit more detail in the next graph, uh, say, for instance, if we were to start across all systems and look at the importance of, scheme, of the scheme, you'll see here that just over 40% of farmers participated in the, in, in, the, in the beam scheme. So the beam payments would have been 100 euros a head on a slaughtered animal and 40 euros per head for a suck, for, for a suck or cow. But uh, not all farms participated because there, you had to sign up to uh, certain terms and conditions in relation to, 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 to destocking in the future. But for the farmers who did sign up, 40% of farmers who did sign up, the average payment in 2019 was the order of 2,200 euros. 
So obviously it's a hugely important scheme. Like across all farms, it added, it added 950 euros to farm income across the whole, the whole sample. So that would mean without BEAM in 2019, instead of talking about a 2% rise in income, we would have been talking about a 1, 1.5% decrease in, in income. So th those monies were hugely significant in 2009. Schemes I've listed here are predominantly cattle schemes. So if we look at the cattle rearing farms, you can see how important they are. Um, so although all cattle rearing farms would have been eligible, uh, only 57% uh, participated. And where they did, the payment was 1,300 euros. This is the new scheme worthy of note this, this year, particularly because uh, the beef pilot scheme that ran for 2019 paid farmers 40 euros per Per suckler cow, and the average payment uh, ended up being about a thousand euros a farm. That scheme has been increased uh, for 2020, 2021, and the payment per, he per head will will rise to 80 to 90 euros. So obviously, a, a very significant scheme, and, and ha had an, had a significant impact for the farmers who participated in 19. Um, glossage, as you'd expect, is hugely important uh, on these cattle rearing farms, as is the BGGP scheme. So the glass payment per farm that participated is just over 4,000 euros, 4,200 euros, and the BGGP, BG, G, BGDP scheme is worth 1,700 euros. So these are very important schemes for, for, for cattle farms. If we were to look at, say, dairy farms, for instance, you don't see that these schemes being as important. So they're very system specific. They're very important on sheep farms, particularly glass. The average payment on a, on a sheep farm is, is nearly 4,400 euros and half of all sheep farms are participating in those schemes. So after this presentation, we forward on the, these slides and this, this website and you, you, can, you can dive through all those schemes by system if you wish. I'll talk about a couple more, the more important pillar two schemes in the next slide. Basically, you can see here, the green bar here is, is, is the old disadvantaged areas, the, the, the areas of natural constraint scheme. See, most farms, three quarters of all farms participate in the A and C scheme. And the average payment is something like 2,600 euros for 2019. Uh, the other bar that, that where you see high levels of participation is you see high levels of participation by sheep farmers in the sheep welfare scheme. So 80% of farmers uh, are participating in, the, in, in that scheme. Uh, and the average payment is just under 13, is just over 1300 euros. So a very important scheme for, for that sector. The other uh, scheme I bring your attention to here is the TAM scheme. Okay, it's not very important if you look at the number of farms participating, only 6% of farms participating. But what you do see is where farms participate in TAMs, uh, there is significant funding. This is a capital, a capital grant that farmers get, it can be up to the value of 40% of the investment. And you can see that where, where farmers participated, and you see 14% of dairy farmers participating, the level of funding they received is, was, was a magnitude of nearly, nearly 19,000 euros. So for the farmers who participate, TAMS is a very important scheme. Uh, obviously, this can be money in that scheme for low emission sorry spending as well as, uh, as buildings. Uh, and we see tillage farmers having drawn down significant money under that scheme in 2019 as well. Other smaller schemes noted here, the forestry scheme, the organic and the organic scheme. So small levels uh, of participation the in the organic scheme, in the magnitude of about 2%, but where farms are participating, the, the value of that scheme is nearly 7,000 euros. So uh, obviously you can, you can dive through that detail if you wish after the presentation. I'll focus now after, uh, after talking about TAMs, we'll move on and talk about investments. So obviously saw high levels of grant aid under TAMs for certain farmers. Uh, and we saw Trevor talking about uh, kind of the, the decent incomes, I suppose, that had been achieved on dairy farms. But dairy farms, by their nature, plow lots of money back into their farm business. And if we were to look at investment that has happened this year in 2019, uh, the total invested on farm nearly reached 1 billion euros. So it's 980 million, and over half of that is invested by dairy farmers. So Trevor's talked about having 16,000 16, dairy farmers in the country. Um, they're still they're investing about 33,000 euros per farm into their, into their farm business. And if we quantify that over 10 years, um, these farms have invested about 3.5 billion in their, in their facilities. 
uh, in the 10 years. So serious levels of investment ga gone on here and really different than any other farm system. And I suppose that's not surprising when you see the low levels of income that exist across the dry sock systems. It's unsurprising that a cattle farmer is, is investing three, maybe 3,000 euros in their business uh, when they're not delivering on, on the, the levels of profitability uh, that we see in, in some of the other sectors. Basically, that investment breaks down pretty much 50-50 between buildings and, and machinery. Uh, the green bar being land improvement investment, but generally 50-50, small but different on a tillage farm where, where most of the investment tends to be, tends to be in machinery. The, the question of investment begs the question about where does the money come from and, uh, and the question about debt. Uh, within, within the farm survey, our data collectors will obviously collect this information. We don't see any change happening in 2019. Average debt levels are unchanged, um, but there are va major variations across sector, and 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 also by type of farm. What we would see is that two thirds of all farms have no have no business related, no farm related debt, and that really skews the average. So if we're looking at average debt, uh, it, it may be kind of uh, it would skew the result if if we just looked at. Uh, the averages. So in the next slide, I look at just farms who just farms who have debt. Um, the types of debt generally tends to be more long-term debt on, on Irish farms. Okay, So the red bar here are medium to, to long-term debt, and this would be split 50-50 between medium and long-term. On a dairy farm, 40% of the 40 percent of the borrowing tends to be long-term. Another 40% tends to be medium-term, one to 10-year loan. And the remaining 20% met up between higher purchase and short term and overdraft uh, facilities. So if we strip out the farms here that have no debt and we just that ha have no debt and just look at the farmers with debt, we see that 64% of, uh, of dairy farms ha ha have borrowings, and the average debt on those farms is in the region of about 112,000 euros. Uh, the income of that cohort would be just shy of 75,000. Um, so their incomes are, are higher than, than average uh, and their, their, de their debt is about one and a half times uh, their, their average income. That ratio has improved this year on the basis of incomes having, come in, having gone up. But also what you see is after four or five successive years of increases in, in debt levels, and that's not unsurprising when you see all the investment that has happened, we see that level start to reduce uh, start to reduce this year. Okay, so that, there, that's the debt situation uh, from 2014 to 2019. I'll finish a couple of slides on talk about farm demographics uh, and household uh, uh, viability. So Trevor obviously mentioned earlier how important off farm employment is on these farms. Um, obviously with low levels of income, you know, to sustain the household off farm employment is going to be required. And we don't see that this red line, this hasn't changed in the, la in, in the last seven to eight years. Okay, so what we see on average here is that 52% of the households, either the holder or the spouse, is working off farm. I haven't put this up by farm system because it's, it's, it, what's, surpri what's kind of surprising is this, there's very little variation by system. So generally across system, uh, would be 51 to 53 percent of of the households have uh, have off farm employment. Now, what you do see, all right, is a dairy farm. The, the holder would only be working off farm about 10 percent of the time, but the holder spouse would be working 46 percent of the time. So, the spouse tends to have a a job on a dairy farm much much more often than a a, a dry stock or, or a sheep farm. So, and um, that that is the one thing to note on this uh, off, -farm, off farm employment. In relation to farmer age, it has crept up over the years. The average age as it stands in 2019 is 58, slightly younger for the dairy farmers tend to be four or five years younger. Uh, and the dairy farms household size tends to, tends to, be, tends to be bigger. 3.3 uh, okay, uh, people live per household as opposed to 2.3 uh, uh, on, the, on the sheep farms. And generally, I suppose the fact that they're younger, it's not unexpected. They would ha ha have be fewer people in the house on, in the household on dairy farms in receipt of a pension. So, on average, thirty percent of farms are in receipt of a pension, uh, much lower on the dairy farms uh, than on the on the other systems. And this off-farm employment data 
when you put it together with the farm incomes data, it allows us to look and classify farms into their, their, their viability. And so what we say is that if a farm can remunerate the, the, the labor of the farm and provide a 5% return on, on non-land assets such as machinery and, and livestock, we classify the, the farm as, as being viable. Uh, if a farm isn't viable, but there's off-farm employment, we classify it as sustainable. And if the farm's neither viable or sustainable, then, then it's vulnerable and, and the farm isn't making a return uh, that will sustain the, the farm into the future. Uh, what we see this year is a very equitable split between viable, sustainable and vulnerable. So 33% of, of, of the farms in the country uh, being classed as you know, uh, vulnerable in 2019. So that's in the region of 30,000 30, 30, farms. And that's up uh, from 2017, slightly down, on, slightly down on 18. What you would see with this, with, with the viability is it totally changes uh, depending on what system you look at. So obviously the profitability of the, the dairy sector means that over three quarters of all dairy businesses are economically viable. Uh, businesses only about 12% would, would be classified as vulnerable. Uh, you see a totally different uh, classification when you look at cattle rearing and cattle other farms, which are which have a lot higher levels of off-farm employment uh, for the holder, as Trevor would have said, but much higher levels of of, of vulnerability. And um, some that we note in relation to the vulnerable, these vulnerable. Uh, this vulnerable category, uh, many of these people tend to be older. And when we look at the percentages of them that have pensions, we would see that 57% of that se sector, those vulnerable farms, have a pension. But that means they're still going on what just over a third, uh, where there is no other, where there is no other off farm income, uh, and uh, they're in a very vulnerable position. And we see that these tend to be in these cattle rearing and dry stock sectors. Um, so this, this, is, this viability has shown some volatility over time, but in 2019, we, we end up with a, a very even spread uh, across, across the, the three categories. And so that, that would conclude our, our presentation. I, I'll pass back to Mark uh, for, for, for questions. Uh, just thank, thank you all for, for tuning in and thanks to all our farmers uh, for um, making themselves available on, over this past very stressful time uh, to, to participate in the National Farm Survey. Uh, we're very thankful to them for making themselves available. So thanks very much. Thank you very much for that, Brian and Trevor. Really excellent presentation. And uh, personally, the, I found the, the graphics really uh, made it very easy to, to understand the figures there. So Thank you to those who have sent their questions in so far. Um, please do use the, the Q&A tab if you have any further questions. Um, I propose that for the next 10 minutes, we will just go through those questions um, and just have a discussion around some of the results that have been presented there. So we could ask the, the, the rest of the panel if they could switch on their, their uh, microphones and their, their videos as well so we can see. And Brian, if you could also just maybe stop sharing your screen also um, uh, so that we can, we can maybe have a, a discussion around the, the questions that are coming in here. So uh, just to, to kick things off, uh, of course, uh, the, the, the Brexit word is mentioned here in some of uh, the questions um, <coughs> we have is around uh, the, the distorting effect of Brexit uh, on farm incomes during 2019. Um, do we have any information on that, whether this has had an effect on, on uh, the enterprises? It's had an effect, had an effect um, in the sense that we know that Brexit has is one of the drivers for um, weak demand, weak economic growth in the UK, and uh, and a weakening uh, sterling euro exchange rate. So that's those two things combined to uh, in part explain why beef prices have been so poor. Um, but I guess that the challenge is that Brexit is likely not to be a, dist a one offer of temporary distortion, but to be a new, new uh, reality that we will have to um, get used to and, and figure out uh, as time goes by. And we don't know how uh, the European Union and the UK will relate to one another after the end of this year. That's still on the, on the stove. Um, but there still remains a risk that um, there could be either barriers to trade between Ireland and the UK 
or that we could be exporting into a market in the UK that is much more competitive in the, in the sense that we would be competing against other uh, beef products on that market from that we haven't had to compete with on the UK market for over 40 years. So still a lot of unknowns there. Uh, Trevor, um, you have showed, shown in your presentation the, the growth that has taken place in dairy cow numbers, uh, milk yield and production. Uh, we have just a question here in relation to the um, reduction in the number of dairy farms. I'm just asking for a comment on, on that, the, the consolidation that, or what levels of consolidation are we seeing there? Yeah, um, my answer to that question is show me the data. Um, I don't know that, that that is actually the case. I mean, um, we always we always scratch our heads in, uh, in Ireland talking about how many farms do we actually have at any point in time. Um, the in, in terms of the number of farms represented in the National Farm Survey, dairy farms anyway, at least. I mean that hasn't that hasn't really changed a huge amount at all um, over the over the years that, that are referred to in the question. We used to have a very nice statistic coming from the Department of Agriculture, which was called the the number of quota holders, which was a good a good metric to use in terms of the number of dairy farms that were out there, but you know that that seems to have ceased. Obviously, now that there is no quota system, and um, so I don't think that um, the the total number of dairy farms has has actually changed hugely in the in the, the last seven or eight years. Um, Trevor, if I could just to jump in there, the I just checked the numbers while we were just come, finishing up the seminar. And the, um, the the number of dairy farms has increased by a few hundred since uh, 2010, uh, from just under 16,000 to just about 16,000. And uh, a big change in dairy farm numbers happened in the years 2000 to, to 2010, where we went from 26,000 dairy farms down to just under 16,000. So the, the series you were showing on, on the Power BI slides from 2010 forward, wasn't when the change happened, it actually happened in the decade prior to that, in the end of the 1980s. So we have a question in terms of the, the, the graph that Brian there around the, the, the trends around vulnerability and viability. Um, uh, the, the comment here is that this is surprising and worrying. Uh, the question is, what can we learn from this in terms of desirable policies to increase uh, the percentage of viable farms in a consistent way? So what can we Try and improve the, the numbers that move from that vulnerable category into the viable uh, categories. And I think there's a listen, there's, there's volatility in particular sectors. Uh, I think what we have seen though in relation to the, the dry stock sector, we would have been classifying cattle farms as vulnerable now for, for quite a significant period. Uh, where we see the volatility is more so on the dairy side and the viable farms on the dairy side. And uh, I think there's, there has been policies of late in some of the co-ops to, to help with, with that in relation to uh, uh, forward contracting of milk. I think that, I think that, that sort of thing will, will help. Um, but basically, I think for, for, the, for the dry sock systems, um, unless we see improvements uh, in product prices, you know, I think we're going, to see, we're going to see a lot of farms continue to be in that vulnerable category. Thanks for that, uh, Brian. Does anyone else want to comment on that? Um, I'd, I'd, agree with, I'd, I'd agree with what Brian has said, has said there. I think the, uh, you know, it's about real prices. So it's, it's, we've seen cattle prices actually drift up over the last 10 years, but it hasn't been reflected in improved uh, family farm income on cattle farms because the, the cost of the inputs they use in their farms have also gone up. So what we call the terms of trade and economics that these farmers are facing haven't actually improved. Um, and how the economic viability of those farm households, the, the dry stock ones in particular were relatively small, is going to improve, is, like, is largely going to come from their off-farm uh, economic activity rather than their farming activity. There's unlikely to be a significant enough change in the real prices that farmers are getting. That's prices deflated by the cost of production that are going to drive um, that farm business viability or economic performance to a place where that, 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 that one third, one third, one third uh, split out changes dramatically. Just a, 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 an observation there in relation to the low levels of investment in the, the non-dairy farms. I mean, do we see a 
what, what are the longer term consequences of this, the fact that we have such a relatively low level of, of reinvestment? Uh, Kevin, have you given any consideration to that scenario? I mean, I mean investment usually, usually is a kind of a kind of something that we need for, for productivity goals and productivity improvements. So it's not very positive from the perspective of getting, um, you know, strong shift in income, perform, income growth performance on those farms that are not investing. And the counter point to that is that the farms that are investing heavily, which are predominantly the dairy farms, are ones which are more likely and which we are observing seeing uh, growth in incomes. So, you know, there is an issue there, I guess. Um, but there's also, uh, you know, a lot of these farms that are not investing very much are very small scale farms and they just don't have the economic returns that, that justify <laughs> investing an awful lot of money into them or go, and, a ba and the banks uh, will not lend to them because they don't see the repayment capacity being there. So it's, um, it is a kind of a, you know, small structures, uh, small, very low income levels and kind of, there's a kind of a vicious cycle, unfortunately, that they're, that they're stuck in. Question here about the relationship between a farmer aid viability status. Um, is, there, is, there, is there a correlation between these? I would think that there is. I haven't, it's not something that we've, we've ever um, looked at from the point of view of, of a presentation, as I remember it anyway. But, um, you know, there is the old, the old maxim that dairy farming is a younger man's game. And, and to that extent, uh, we do see in the dairy systems that, uh, you know, the average age profile is that bit lower than, than in the dry stock systems. And... Um, you know, that's borne out then ultimately in the fact that you have much higher levels of viability in, in dairy farming than you would in um, the other systems. So, yeah, I mean, there is a relationship, but I don't, I don't know that we would describe it as a, as a causative relationship. It, it's down to the circumstances of the fact that, um, you know, you, you, you don't tend to have um, older farmers of retirement age who are still actively out milking cows. Okay, well, look, I, I propose that we, we uh, bring the session to a, a close. Um, thank you all for your presentations and your contributions.